Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. Quote, Sometimes his followers had to strain to catch his words. At other times, his voice swelled throughout the auditorium. There was a lucid, personal note in it. He purred, he inflected, he used many illustrations. He adopted an aloof, superior mien, as one cognizant of his own position and power. Yet somehow, every listener felt that his leader was speaking to him or her personally, just as though only the two of them were conversing on the subject." End quote. This was how author H.T. Dorman described cult leader Arthur Bell's charisma and commanding presence as he enraptured his followers during conferences and speeches. They hung on his every word, believing he held the key to salvation. Little did his followers know just how easily that commanding presence would swindle their money and use them to gain unparalleled power. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into Mankind United. The leader, Arthur Bell, claimed he could be in multiple places at the same time and those that didn't join him faced a future as slaves. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. A lot of you have asked how you can help support the show. And if you enjoy the podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, and on Twitter as at Parcast Network. Arthur Bell was a charismatic con man who took advantage of the atmosphere of fear and desperation during the Great Depression. His book spoke of a group of so-called hidden rulers. These were evil, rich people who allegedly worked behind the scenes making sure the poor stayed poor while the rich got richer. Meanwhile, a group of wealthy, good people who called themselves the sponsors would create a utopia for anyone who joined Bell's cult. Mankind United. It was established by Arthur Bell in 1934, and he led the cult until 1951. At its peak, membership may have reached 27,000, but nearly 250,000 people across America expressed interest in Bell's ideas, either by purchasing his book, Mankind United, or by attending a meeting about the utopia Bell was determined to create on Earth. In part one, we'll explore how Bell used an aura of mystery and secrecy to establish himself as a trustworthy leader. We'll investigate how the Great Depression made people vulnerable to his claims. The financial instability and social unrest at the time meant that it was easy for Bell to prey on people's paranoia. In part two, we'll investigate how Mankind United evolved after World War I and became Christ's Church of the Golden Rule, We'll also explore the manipulative tactics Bell used to keep his followers committed to his cause, even though his promises of a utopia were never followed through on. Arthur Bell went by many names as a cult leader. According to H.T. Dorman, author of the book California Cult, The Story of Mankind United, Bell introduced himself to his followers as Division Superintendent, The Speaker, The Voice, Department A, the voice of the right idea, and the church trustee. He also took on aliases such as J.J. Jackson, L. Patrick, J.B. Fountaine, L. Osborne, and Patrick Chapman. Secrecy and mystery were incredibly important to Bell, keeping his followers in the dark as much as possible, even about something as simple as his name, allowed him to seem like more than just a man to them. As we explore Bell's life, it's important to note that he wasn't revealed to be the leader of Mankind United until 1942. It wasn't until the FBI placed 16 cult leaders and Bell under arrest for wartime sedition that Bell was unmasked as the group's leader. Prior to that, he had presented himself as simply a mouthpiece for the cause as a whole. This gave the illusion that the cult's roots ran far deeper than they actually did, His followers didn't see him as a leader, but as their connection to the elusive sponsors. 
His quest for secrecy means that we know little of his upbringing. We know that Arthur Lowler Osborne Fontaine Bell was born in Newington, New Hampshire on March 29, 1900. According to Bell, his father was a Presbyterian minister. His mother was a home missionary and a minister's daughter. His father died when he was four. Bell often spoke of how much pressure fell on him to provide for the family after the death of his father. Since we don't have many details about Bell's upbringing, we can't know for sure how the death of his father impacted him. However, we do know that he proudly proclaimed to his followers that he'd only had four years of schooling before venturing out on his own to find ways of making money. With little formal training, he may have been compelled to prove himself as a competent businessman. Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for this show. She'll be handling the psychological elements of our story. Psychologist Alfred Adler's research, which coined the term inferiority complex, explored how people may exhibit neurotic behaviors to compensate for a perceived lack of worth. He may have felt intense pressure to do better than those who'd received a better education than him. Bell was born during an incredible time of industrial growth in America. After the Civil War ended in 1865, America looked like it would never recover from the wounds of internal turmoil. It was seen as a failed experiment. The country that had successfully revolted and claimed independence looked like it was unraveling. However, by the beginning of the 20th century, America had shockingly emerged as one of the world's most powerful nations. This dramatic change in reputation was due to the captains of industry at the time. Those men were Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Henry Ford, J.P. Morgan, and Thomas Edison. The beginning of the 20th century was a time of booming growth for the United States. Major oil fields were producing record amounts of oil. The U.S. was the largest steel producer in the world. Cities had electricity, and telephones were coming into wide use across the nation. Railroads were expanding across the country. Ford's company began producing the Model T automobile. These industrial giants had a profound effect on Americans psychologically. It seemed that anyone could be the next rags-to-riches story. Andrew Carnegie was the epitome of this idea. He'd come from truly humble means. His family lived in a one-room cottage and shared the ground floor with their neighbors. By age 21, he was superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. By age 54, Carnegie Steel Corporation dominated the steel industry. For more information about Carnegie, be sure to check out our Historical Figures episode about him. There was a dark side to all this progress, though. The lower classes worked long hours for little pay. When they attempted to unionize, new workers, also referred to as scabs, were brought in in their place. Violent confrontations occurred as police and labor unionizers clashed. The Haymarket riot had occurred on May 4, 1886. Seven police officers and at least four civilians were killed and 60 others were injured after violence broke out at a protest labor leaders had organized. The protest had started out peaceful, but when police arrived, someone threw a dynamite bomb and police began shooting into the crowd. Americans dreamed of following a path to success like Carnegie's, of rising above their current social status and achieving great wealth. Bell ventured out into this environment of both opportunity and unrest. Bell kept much of his own personal history secret from his followers. We do know that he seemed to flourish in this environment between 1915 and 1934. He was a successful businessman and truly did thrive, though lacking a formal education. He was wildly proud of this. He constantly bragged about beating the system and being a self-made man. We don't know when Bell left home, but we know that in 1915, he decided to move to San Francisco. He had relatives living there who provided him with a place to stay. We can assume that Bell felt incredibly excited about venturing out on his own. It would have felt like a fresh start to move west. After the pressures of helping his mother provide for the family at home, he was finally free to live his own dreams. It seems that his family was a weight he was happy to be rid of. While living with his relatives in San Francisco, Bell's aunt introduced him to Christian science. Mary Baker Eddy founded the religious denomination of Christian Science in 1879. She wrote the book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, that would go on to have a profound impact on Bell as a teenager. 
Eddie believed that the material world is an illusion and only the spiritual world is real. There are several ways in which this belief manifests, but Christian scientists are particularly known for believing that illness occurs due to a distance from God rather than from bacteria or viruses. Therefore, one can be cured of disease through prayer alone. Bell fell in love with these ideas. In his own words, quote, I was 15. My aunt, who, because of it, was reviled by the rest of the family, was a Christian scientist. She introduced me to it. There, I found my thirst for truth satisfied. I read Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. At first, I didn't understand it, but I realized here was something that worked. I joined the Mother Church." End quote. When we look at Bell's thoughts on Christian science, it appears he was drawn to it not so much out of a sense of faith, but a desire for truth. The allure of Christian science may have been more related to Bell's desire to appear better educated than others, rather than feeling drawn to the religious denomination itself. This again may have related to an inferiority complex. Bell may have been self-conscious about his lack of formal education and felt the need to prove himself. Finding a religion he saw as superior to that which he grew up with may have made him feel better than other Christians. He loved to talk about how he'd thoroughly investigated religion as a whole and that only Christian science appeared to provide firm answers. It would also have given him direction and structure. He was in a brand new environment and away from his mother for the first time in his life. Christian science offered him something to which he could devote his energy. It also served as the foundation on which he would build his own church. Time for a quick change of subject. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Hi there. I'm hosting a brand new show on ParCast called Mythology. It dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. I've already listened to part one, and I can't wait for part two. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's part one on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. Vanessa and I have some exciting news for you. Starting now, you can listen to Cults episodes that are older than six months, completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. We're always looking for ways to improve the listener experience. We found an amazing partner in Stitcher to bring you episodes ad-free six months after they're released. Again, this will only affect episodes that are older than six months. Nothing else will change. We'll still be releasing new Cults episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. For a free month trial, go to stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. That's stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. Now let's get back to the story. 18-year-old Arthur Bell served in the California Coast Artillery Corps, for a brief time toward the end of World War I. This corps served alongside French forces in Europe, though not all regiments saw combat. Bell was honorably discharged. We don't have any accounts that document Bell's feelings about serving in the war. However, we do know how combat affected many young soldiers. Though Bell didn't serve abroad, we know some of the psychological traits that would have made people vulnerable to occult's claims. The idea of shell shock, a concept we refer to today as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was first acknowledged after World War I. The young soldiers came home shaken and unable to readjust to everyday life. It's important to note how World War I differed from previous wars. Americans had felt extremely confident after winning the Spanish-American War, 
where the relatively new country defeated a historic, powerful empire. After this, America was recognized as an imperialistic power, a drastic change after the turmoil of the Civil War. Young soldiers were unprepared for the brutality of World War I. This was the first war where chemical weapons such as phosgene, chlorine, and mustard gas were used on a large scale. It was a horrifying shock for the men to see their peers die from such cruel weapons of war. Prior to World War I, symptoms of PTSD had been recognized in victims of train accidents. The diagnosis was railway spine. Doctors recognized that patients still seemed to suffer from the traumatic event even after their physical wounds had healed. Though PTSD affected a large number of the young men who'd fought in World War I, it wasn't recognized as a severe issue by the general public. It was commonly believed that soldiers suffering symptoms of PTSD lacked the resolve required to be a soldier. Symptoms of PTSD were so common among soldiers, though, that for the first time, doctors began to focus on the mental health effects war had on the young men who suffered through it. Even the term shell shock insinuates that the effects will only be short term. People at the time thought it was something the men would eventually be able to simply shake off. The terminology has evolved over the years to refer to the symptoms as post-traumatic stress syndrome. Societally, young men were pressured to resume their daily lives when the war ended. Soldiers suffering from PTSD symptoms would have felt like there was something wrong with them individually. They wouldn't have had a support system to turn to for mental health help. Given Bell's silence on his experience, we can't know what his mental health state was after World War I. Though Bell may not have spoken about the war, we know that Mankind United would later take on a firmly anti-war stance at the beginning of World War II. After World War I, at age 19, Bell plunged back into business dealings in San Francisco. He focused primarily on real estate and insurance. He told his followers that due to his amazing capacity for making money, he easily could have chosen to live a life of luxury instead of devoting himself to Mankind United. It's important to remember, however, that this was a reputation backed up only by Bell's own account. As we go forward, we need to note that all of the following is according to Bell's account. We don't have firm details on what happened between 1919 and 1934. We only know the story that Bell told his followers. According to Bell, in 1919, when he was 19 years old, a group Bell referred to as the Sponsors reached out to him and brought him into their International Legion of Vigilantes. It was in this group that he allegedly took part in a 15-year educational course about what would eventually become Mankind United. As described by Bell in his 1934 book, Mankind United, the Sponsors were a group of wealthy people who had gathered on Christmas Day in 1875 to discuss why there was so much war, greed, and hatred in the world. These people felt that the world's problems could easily be solved with technology. The group was originally numbered at 60, but allegedly grew to 200 as the movement spread. The two groups apparently preventing humans from living in peace were the hidden rulers and the money changers. These were rich people who wanted to prevent anyone else from gaining power. They'd established a network of evil to keep humanity enslaved. According to Bell, the hidden rulers were willing to kill anyone in their way. They were behind the world's revolutions and wars, using them as a way to kill off half of the world's population. The sponsors had $60 million collectively and promised to use it to help humanity and free them from the hidden rulers and money changers. They established the International Institute of Universal Research and Administration. This institute was dedicated to researching how the sponsors could help free people from the tyranny of the hidden rulers. Bell wrote that the sponsors had pledged to overcome the money changers and hidden rulers. The sponsors spied on the money changers over the years. They worked to develop incredible means of economic production. Bell said that the sponsors had to work in secret so the money changers wouldn't catch on to them. Anonymity was the key element to the cause. If any of the sponsors were named, according to Bell, the entire group would have to abandon all research and leave humanity to remain eternally enslaved. Bell never admitted that any of his story was a lie. Research on pathological liars shows that sometimes they tell a lie so often they start to believe it. 
Research led by Yaling Yang and Adrian Rain shows that pathological liars have abnormalities in their prefrontal cortex. In Rain's words, quote, pathological liars can't always tell the truth from falsehood and contradict themselves in an interview. They're manipulative, and they admit they prey on people. They're very brazen in terms of their manner, but very cool when talking about this, end quote. Bell may have told this story to himself and to his followers so many times that he began to believe elements of it. Rain continues, quote, Our argument is that the more networking there is in the prefrontal cortex, the more the person has an upper hand in lying. Their verbal skills are higher. They've almost got a natural advantage, end quote. Bell had a natural ability to manipulate people. He was charismatic and charming, so vulnerable people were easily swayed to his cause. All he had to do was pack his story full of enough believable details, and he was able to convince people it was real. Bell said he was asked to join the International Legion of Vigilantes in 1919. The sponsors had supposedly been investigating the hidden rulers and money changers for 44 years by this time. Bell wrote that in that time, the sponsors had developed a plan for completely changing the economy, so people only needed to work four hours a day, four days a week, eight months a year. They had found unambiguous proof of the hidden ruler's existence. However, before they could reveal this plan or their proof, they'd need 200 million people to join the cause of Mankind United. Bell didn't begin to recruit followers to Mankind United until 1934. He said that from 1919 to 1934, he worked as a secret agent for the sponsors. We only know very few details about Bell's personal life from 1919 to 1934. One thing we know is that he married his first wife in 1921. According to Bell, it was the secrecy required to be an agent for the sponsors that brought his marriage to an end in 1931. We also know that during this time, two books, Looking Backward and Equality by Edward Bellamy, had a significant impact on him. Looking Backward focuses on what America might look like under a socialist system. It was published in 1888 and is set in Boston in 2000. Bellamy argued that America would flourish under socialism and we'd see an increase in compassion and cooperation. The book sold over a million copies. It hit a nerve after the Depression of 1883 and the Haymarket Riot of 1886. It's important to note that although America was flourishing at the beginning of the 20th century, the wealth gap was widening. America had done well financially at the beginning of World War I, trading goods to Europe. However, after World War I, production remained at a high level, while demand had decreased dramatically. People in labor-intensive fields worked long hours for little pay. As they attempted to unionize, violent confrontations often broke out between protesters and the police, as was seen with the Haymarket riot. When Bellamy's book came out in 1888, it spoke to the fears and anger the lower and middle classes were feeling. Rumors began among Mankind United members years later that Bellamy had been one of the original sponsors. Bell's 1934 book, Mankind United, pulls from and could even be accused of plagiarizing many of Bellamy's ideas. Another event that occurred before Bell went public with his book was that America was being hit hard by the Great Depression. America's economy had been fragile before the Depression hit. There'd been an illusion of prosperity in the 20s, but the gap between the upper class and the middle and lower classes had grown wider and wider. On October 24, 1929, investors panicked in droves and sold more than 16 million stocks. This caused the stock market to crash. In 1930, Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. This act had been designed to protect American products from imports. However, it caused other countries to impose their own tariffs. This caused international trade to collapse in 1931 and 1932, leading to the depths of the Depression. The peak of the Great Depression occurred in 1933. By this point, 12,830,000 people, that's 25% of the workforce, were unemployed. During this time, Bell's lucrative business interests suffered major losses. In January 1934, Bell married a woman who was 29 years older than him. She was independently wealthy and a Christian scientist like Bell. 
As far as we know, she never engaged in any of the cult activities. Bell said that she was too busy as a homemaker and devoting herself to Christian science to join Mankind United. We don't know what her true feelings were, but we do know her wealth helped Bell fund the cult. That same year, Bell was allegedly asked by the sponsors to present the Mankind United program to the public. He said that he never saw the sponsor who approached him, but that they'd spoken to him in the dark and told him to present his first lecture. Bell said that he was appointed division superintendent in 1934, and thereafter devoted all of his time and energy to Mankind United. When Bell began to promote the Mankind United cause publicly, he knew he could tap into people's feelings of desperation, paranoia, and fear. He just needed to find the best way to get his message out into the world. Bell's story of pure and evil forces wrestling behind the scenes over the future of humanity may seem far-fetched, but we need to take into account how vulnerable Americans were to such ideas. People are most susceptible to falling for a cult leader's ideas during a time of emotional turmoil. According to psychologist Maria Konnikova, times of political upheaval, instability, and uncertainty are when con men find the most success. Humans crave answers. During a time of unrest, someone peddling simple solutions can seem like a godsend. Konnikova's research also shows that humans love a good story. She wrote in her novel, The Confidence Game, quote, when a story is plausible, we often assume it's true, end quote. Bell's confident delivery of his story easily swayed people into believing him. Bell published and printed his text of Mankind United very quickly after the alleged encounter with the anonymous sponsor. He spread the word about it to friends as well as business associates. Bell resorted to odd means of reaching out to people. According to H.T. Dorman, quote, an Oakland, California accordion teacher, Mr. Orlando Menachetti, told the Tenney Legislative Fact-Finding Committee that sometime in 1934, Mr. Bell had taken accordion lessons, piano lessons, voice lessons, and dance lessons in his studio. And during this time, Bell harried him for lists of his students their names and addresses, occupations, and approximate incomes, end quote. Bell devoted much of his time to getting the word of his cause out to people. Middle-class people were especially interested in his message as they'd experienced the most dramatic economic shift after the Depression. Bell also began talking about some of his stranger ideas. The accordion teacher, Mr. Manichetti, mentioned that Bell had also talked to him about a race of men with large heads who wore metallic hats. He said they were incredibly intelligent and controlled earthquakes and floods, end quote. According to Menichetti, quote, he was the type of man who was always the same, who had a complacent attitude, always smiling and good-natured. He mentioned to me at one time that after he got this movement started, I would never see him again, but I'd hear his voice. He told me of his journeys in his sleep. I didn't know what to make of him. I was always mystified by him. End quote. Bell's charisma served him well. Things began to take off for the cult in 1934. People flocked to banquet halls and auditoriums in San Francisco to hear Bell preach about Mankind United. He offered free pamphlet materials, but they had to pay to receive a copy of his book. These sales would provide much of the funding for the cult in the early days. Bell told people at these gatherings about the sponsor's vision for utopia. According to the Mankind United text, they would only need to work four hours per day, four days a week, eight months each year. The Mankind United text itself didn't offer proof of the hidden rulers. Instead, it offered an invitation for members to take part in a 30-day program that would teach them everything the sponsors had learned about the hidden rulers. According to sociologist John Laughlin in his book, Protest, Studies of Collective Behavior and Social Movements, the 30-day program would be comprised of Quote, two-hour programs repeated day and night, 12 times each 24 hours, five days a week. Irrefutable and exhaustive proof would be offered as to how the money changers worked and how utopia was possible, end quote. There was a condition, however. Bell told his followers that the sponsors wouldn't offer the program until Mankind United had reached 200 million members. Until that number was reached, the sponsors would keep their information secret. Suddenly, his followers were spurred to action. 
desperate to grow their numbers exponentially before civilization could collapse. And through their efforts, Bell's fortune and influence soared. And now here's something we're proud to share with you. Now, let's get back to the story. In 1934, 34-year-old Arthur Bell's cult started to spread like wildfire. His congregates believed that they could only reach utopia once the organization had reached 200 million members. This created a sense of urgency among the members to spread the word to others and to get friends, family, and acquaintances to purchase the Mankind United text. The people at these meetings were made to feel special. Bell told them, quote, you are part of the world's enlightened thinkers, or you would not have been invited to this meeting, end quote. He made them feel like they were smarter than the so-called slaves, Bell mentioned, who just bought into the system of oppression the hidden rulers had created. Everyone who attended the meetings was told to spread the word to their inner circle. Arthur Bell tapped into people's feeling of desperation at the height of the Depression. They were shaken by financial turmoil, as well as World War I. The idea that a group of evil, wealthy people were behind the scenes preventing them from getting ahead and causing wars to increase suffering wouldn't have seemed all that far-fetched. Research on the psychological impact of an economic depression shows that birth rates drop as anxiety increases. We also see a decrease in community activities. As columnist Doyle McManus writes, quote, as the recession deepens, participation in civic activities, community organizations, volunteer groups, even church attendance and social clubs is likely to drop. Sociologists once assumed that during hard times, people would naturally band together, if only to protest their plight or to give each other solace. It turns out that the opposite is true. Economic distress causes people to withdraw, end quote. This makes people especially vulnerable to a cult leader's idea. They're lonely and feel isolated from their community. Simply feeling like they belong somewhere can be one of the biggest draws for people who become cult followers. Research also shows that economic depressions cause people to be more pessimistic. Studies show that middle-aged, middle-class white people tend to feel the most pessimistic in these circumstances. This demographic was the one most drawn to Bell's ideas. Bell tended to attract middle-aged housewives to his cause the most. The cult attracted a ratio of about three men for every four women. Bell's charisma was especially alluring to women. He was mysterious and commanding. Though he wasn't necessarily a handsome man, he paid special attention to the theatricality of how he presented himself. Therefore, he came across as important and trustworthy. Another aspect that drew women to the cult is that they were treated more equally doing work for the cult than they were in everyday society. People who felt forgotten by society were drawn to Bell's message of a utopia. The cult drew mostly people from urban areas, as that was where the bureaus were established. People with a background similar to Bell's were also drawn to the cult. A significant portion of followers had had to leave school to help their family financially. The average member of Mankind United had a ninth or 10th grade level of education. They were similar to Bell in that they proudly said that they'd received a better education studying on their own in the real world versus continuing on with a formal education. Another attractive element to Mankind United is that when Bell first began spreading the word about his cause, it wouldn't have seemed like an enormous time or money commitment. In the beginning, once someone had purchased a copy of Mankind United, they automatically became a member of the group. As the cult established a foundation over the next couple of years, bureau managers were hand-picked by Bell. These were members who had joined early on and who he saw as reliable and loyal. These managers organized their own lower-level meetings. In this way, Mankind United spread throughout California. It had a fairly stable bureaucratic structure. There was a hierarchy among the cult leaders. At the top was Bell, the division superintendent. The second highest were the bureau managers. The third level was the captains, then the lieutenants, and finally the registrants. Bureaus were established in Berkeley, Oakland, Fresno, Sacramento, Bakersfield, and across the Central Valley, according to author H.T. Dorman. At its peak in 1939, Mankind United had 25 bureaus across California. It's believed that membership in these individual bureaus may have ranged up to the thousands. 
However, because the cult kept records locked tight, it's impossible to know exactly how many members total were in the cult. At a meeting on May 16, 1939, Bell told an audience of 6,000, quote, of a total of slightly over 173 million persons who were thought to have indicated a desire to become members of our audience, less than 75 million have actually qualified for this privilege, end quote. Cult leaders use tactics like this to make members feel special. It makes them feel like they were selected for a reason and have found a place where they're truly valued. Bell gave the illusion that people were desperate to join Mankind United, but were being turned away for a lack of devotion to the cause. In reality, it looks like about 250,000 people across the Pacific coast expressed interest to some degree. These were people who attended a meeting at some point purchased the book, or engaged with cult members to get more information about the group. The text of Mankind United cost only 29 cents to bind and was sold for $2.50. So Bell made 10 times the amount he spent on publishing the book each time a copy sold. The book itself isn't eloquently written. It's dense and repetitive. However, people loved its message of a utopia that seemed so easily attainable if they just devoted their time and energy to the cause. Bell did a great job of convincing followers the cult had spread worldwide, though in reality it was contained to California. As Dorman writes about the popularity of the cult, quote, Few of the tens of thousands of Californians who attended Mankind United meetings in the late 1930s would have been interested in the cult had they not been convinced that Mankind United was worldwide in scope, organized by the almost legendary sponsors." End quote. Followers were content with not knowing who the sponsors were as they trusted Bell to be their mouthpiece. Secrecy is a recurring theme in terms of both Bell's personal life and Mankind United as a whole. Keeping his personal life a secret would have forced followers to fill in the gaps about him with their own imaginations. He carefully crafted how he presented himself to his followers. Followers who were later interviewed about Bell reported that he was charismatic and automatically drew attention to himself. He was theatrical and would go so far as to show up to Mankind United meetings late so the room would be kept in suspense. He then announced that he was incredibly busy devoting himself to the cause, but had made time for them constantly desiring more information from Bell, but receiving only tiny details would have made him seem all the more enigmatic and mysterious. By using secrecy as a means of control, Bell would have been able to establish himself as the only person with a full view of the truth. This sort of tactic is one we often see used by cult leaders. In Robert Lifton's research on brainwashing, he explored how cult and totalitarian leaders manipulate human communication to gain a firmer hold of the people they're trying to control. The leaders isolate followers from outside communication. Due to the fact that followers are kept in the dark, they end up entirely dependent on what they're told by the cult leader or leaders. The followers trusted and were charmed by Bell. So when Bell told them that the key elements of the sponsor's agenda needed to be kept secret, they trusted that it was for their own good. Cult leaders maintain control of followers by telling them that it's not that they want to keep secrets, but that they must do so to serve a higher purpose. Maintaining a sense of mystique is key to maintaining a sense of control of a cult. As Lifton writes, quote, Included in this mystique is a sense of higher purpose, of having directly perceived some imminent law of social development, and of being themselves the vanguard of this development." End quote. Followers then see the leader as specially chosen for the task of leading the cause. For Americans shaken by World War I and the Depression, they were willing to be kept in the dark for someone who finally offered a ray of hope. Bell exploited people's fear to push them to commit to the cult. He told them that the hidden rulers planned to set up a caste system. Only the sponsors could save them from this and bring about utopia. As described by Dorman, the hidden ruler's malevolent caste system would have been set up as such. The, quote, first level, the men and women drudges, illiterate, performing only the lowest menial tasks. Second level, the technicians, i.e. men and women slaves taught only to operate machines. These are literally human automatons. Third level, 80% will be a police force willing to use any brutality to compel obedience to the rulers. 
20% will be so-called intelligentsia, conducting laboratories supplying luxuries and various needs to the rulers. Fourth level, the 40,000 hidden rulers. Each of these, with his family, will rule over a principality." End quote. Bell told people at his meeting that the hidden rulers would each take 25,000 slaves. He described the sparse housing humanity would be forced to live in. He also told them that the hidden rulers would have their choice of the most attractive girls, and those girls would be forced into a harem. This terrified people at his meetings. These ideas might sound absurd, but he was talking to people who already witnessed the most brutal war the world had ever seen. A group of wealthy people taking complete control of the country didn't seem that far beyond imagination. All the people at these meetings needed to do was spread the word about Mankind United to everyone they knew, saving them from the dystopia that would be wrought by the rulers. He made followers feel as though he'd let them in on a secret. Now it was their job to recommend his book and program to other people who could be counted on to do the same. Bell told followers, quote, we do not have to wait for thousands of years for further evolution to take us into it. But today, mankind should realize the heaven that is here and at hand." End quote. Mankind United meetings themselves involved a reading from the text and from related cult texts. People at the meetings were asked whether they were members or guests. They were urged to lend out cult texts. The bureau manager or another special speaker would then give a speech about what had been going on within the cult. He would emphasize that he had special insight into secret news as a higher up in the cult. He'd say he'd obtain this news from a meeting with Bell. The meeting would then end with a plea for help and cooperation. The bureau manager would ask attendees to reach out to people who were likely to buy the books in bulk. Bell's main manipulation tactic was keeping his followers in suspense. According to one former follower, quote, We never knew why we did most of the things we did. If we ever questioned any of his orders, he would inform us, You don't know why this is to be done, but you'll see. Trust me and the sponsors, there is a purpose. You'll see later that this is necessary. End quote. This created a constant sense of urgency among followers. They blindly followed his directions, believing that answers were right around the corner. Directions issued to bureau managers also mentioned that followers should be kept constantly busy. They were to arrange two meetings per week and to assign readings so the followers' schedules were constantly packed with cult activities. They were constantly busy preparing for the sponsors to finally reveal themselves. Bell told the bureau managers, in all your meetings with your people, never lift them up without giving them a chore, a duty to perform. In 1939, things were going extremely well for the cult. Book sales and cult numbers were the highest they'd ever been. Then, World War II broke out. Bell told his followers that the war was just another part of the hidden ruler's plot. Therefore, Mankind United took an official stance against the war. However, Bell knew the dangers of publicly speaking out against the war effort. As a result, the cult became even more secretive. He put an end to public Mankind United meetings. The group as a whole became more secretive about who was allowed to join. Another result of the cult becoming more selective was that members were more and more isolated from the rest of society. This meant that Bell had even tighter control of environment and the atmosphere of the cult's community. The cult members remained compliant, as they felt that to do otherwise would cause the sponsors to abandon them. As psychiatrist and cult expert Robert Lifton writes, quote, having experienced the impact of what they consider to be an ultimate truth and having the need to dispel any possible inner doubts of their own, they consider it their duty to create an environment containing no more and no less than this truth. In order to be the engineers of the human soul, they must first bring it under observational control, end quote. Bell put an end to book sales in early 1940 in his effort to keep his anti-war views secret. Selling copies of Mankind United had provided the group with the majority of their funding. So now, Bell had to devise a new way to make money. A new set of classes were established by the International Institute of Universal Research and Administration. For a $20 fee, $373.52 in today's money, followers could take part in a so-called preliminary training program. 
This course would set them up to become instructors and educators when the sponsors finally revealed themselves publicly and began their 30-day program. This was another part of Bell's ploy to keep followers constantly busy. The more his followers were busy with classes and readings, the less time they had to question his teachings. Six years had passed since Bell's 1934 introduction of the cause. Bell kept changing his story about the timeline for the reveal of the sponsor's plan. Whenever followers appeared to grow antsy or asked too many questions about when the 30-day program would start, Bell offered a new excuse for why there had been a delay. He constantly placed blame on the cult members. He made them feel as though it was their fault the sponsors didn't feel comfortable coming forward. Cult membership wasn't yet high enough, Bell would tell them. The sponsors wouldn't appear publicly until they knew they'd be met with a group utterly devoted to their cause. It was only then that they'd be able to experience utopia. Arthur Bell kept telling followers that they had to raise more money for the cause. This money came out of pocket for the cult members. He told them that if financial goals weren't met, utopia couldn't be achieved. As Dorman writes, quote, It is well nigh impossible to delineate the cult mission apart from cult finance. So intertwined were the two. Bulletins from headquarters kept up a never-ending pattern that in order to achieve this, it was necessary to do that. In the same breath with sermons on idealistic principles came forth the most mundane financial exhortations." End quote. Bell was able to convince followers to give their time and energy, but making them believe he was also working constantly on cult activities. Bell maintained that he had to dedicate every waking hour to cult activities. According to him, the energy demand was so high that the sponsors had to provide him with seven doubles. These doubles looked just like him, down to the fingerprints, and allowed him to do seven times the amount of work he would have been able to do on his own. Bell said that he knew little about these doubles, not even their names. He also told followers that though they enabled him to do more work, he still had to work 20 to 22 hours per day. This idea was widely believed by followers. Some believed the sponsors had created these doubles in a manner beyond our comprehension. Others believed they were men dressed to look like Bell. One follower said, quote, He once made me buy seven ties, all alike, for his doubles. Another time, while talking to me over the phone, he said that he had one of his doubles beside him and that he was going to put him on to see if their voices sounded alike. I couldn't tell much difference, end quote. However, Bell's panicky moves to keep the cult underground failed. As his financial demands increased, people began to turn away. By 1941, only 11,500 members remained. World War II had a significant impact on membership as well. People's attention was drawn to the war effort. They didn't have time to dedicate to cult teachings. The members who remained were desperate to hold the cult together. Panic was high among the remaining followers that Mankind United would unravel and utopia would never be achieved. Then came what looked like the beginning of the end for Mankind United. On December 18, 1942, Arthur Bell and 15 of the other cult leaders were arrested by the FBI and accused of violating the Wartime Sedition Act. According to the Los Angeles Examiner, the leaders were charged with, quote, willfully and feloniously conspiring to disseminate false information and reports with intent to interfere with the war effort of the United States and undermine the morale of the armed forces, end quote. The trial took place from April to May in 1943. It revealed Arthur Bell to be the center of the cult. The man who had done everything he could to cloak himself in mystery had finally been unmasked to the public. Newspapers rushed to cover the sensational trial. Twelve leaders, including Bell, were convicted. He and six of the bureau managers were sentenced to five years in federal prison. Lesser charges were doled out to the remaining accused. 1943 was the lowest point for the cult. It looked like the movement would end after the trial. The cult leaders had been financially drained by trial fees and many followers had abandoned ship. However, anyone who thought this was the end of Mankind United had underestimated the craftiness of Arthur Bell. Before the trial had ended, Bell announced that he was forming his own church. As he told a reporter in 1943, quote, 
we've always been a church, although never given standing as a church. One key benefit of evolving into a church was that the cult would be tax exempt. There was a sense of dread in the air. The convicted members were caught in legal battles to have the charges overturned. Yet Bell, a man who had always been able to come up with a new financial ploy when money got tight, would go on to squeeze even more money out of his followers. In part two of our exploration of Arthur Bell, we'll discuss how Mankind United, a cause that had been spread by word of mouth, became Christ's Church of the Golden Rule. His remaining followers quickly fell prey to this new scheme and were more than happy to provide him with even more money, notoriety, and power. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. Some of you have asked how you can help the show. If you enjoy Cults, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can find Cults and all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and Twitter as at ParCast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the ParCast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Russell Nash, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Paul Mahler, Maggie Admire, and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Mandy Bossard and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And here it is, your preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess Athena. I hope you like it. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycolos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain.
Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine. And this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache. And Zeus's son Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, oh headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Oh. Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. 
Ugh, oh, make it stop. End it. I'll cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! <laughs> Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like Pallas to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. 
I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.